This passage from Revelation 13 describes the rise and actions of two beasts, symbolizing corrupt and blasphemous powers. The first beast, given authority to act for 42 months, speaks blasphemies against God and wages war against the saints, gaining global worship except from those whose names are written in the book of life. The second beast, appearing lamb-like but speaking like a dragon, enforces the worship of the first beast through miracles, deception, and economic control, introducing a mark without which no one can buy or sell. This mark, or the number of the beast, is famously identified as 666. Do you think John, who said this number was the number of a man, expected his first century readers to know who he was talking about? Let's find out. Welcome back, everyone, to our walk through Revelation, chapter by chapter. And uh, today we're going to get back into chapter 13, starting at verse 5. But first of all, Ken, it's good to see you. (laughs) It's good to see you too, brother. I'm (laughs) glad we're able to record today. (laughs) We've had a few problems. It's uh. It must be going to be a good one. That's all I know. Uh, it, it, it must. It's going to be life changing because uh, <laughs> you know we've uh, we've tried a couple different things, but um, as long as we're recording, we'll dive in. Uh, Jimmy, last it. last last video we left off on uh, verse number five. So let's dive into uh, Revelation thirteen and verse five, just as a way of reminder. We're looking at the the chapter where we're talking about two different beasts. We're talking about right now the the beast that comes out of the sea. Um, which we've identified as Rome in previous videos. We won't go into too much of that. And then uh, later in this chapter, we're going to see the land beast, which will be identified as Israel. So let's go ahead and dive in in verse number five and pick up with the sea beast. It says in verse number five, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, this idea of 40 in two months, Jimmy, is, uh, this, uh, of course, that's three and a half years. Now, I grew up in a, in a system of interpretation um, that's called dispensationalism. In a very general way, we could call it futurism. And that system teaches that there's a future seven-year period. And one of the ways that I was taught that, and I taught this for many years also from the pulpit, is that I would take these 42-month passages and I would combine a couple of them. And I would say, well, this is just talking about the tribulation part, but if you combine two of them, obviously, that's how you get to your seven seven years. The problem with that is that this is mentioned five times in the book of Revelation. So if you combine them all, you get to 17 and a half years. (laughs) So then you're arbitrarily just putting two of them together. Well, Mm -hmm. there's two and a half of those seven-year period. So... Uh, I think what the Bible is saying here is that there's a 42-month period coming where there's the Great Tribulation, which we've already outlined in our Matthew 24 series. So we see that again, this this time period is listed in this this 42 months, which is roughly how long the Roman-Jewish War lasted, at least the very intense parts where um, the the Romans took out uh, Jerusalem, which is what we're talking about for the Great Tribulation. So let's go ahead and break down this verse. And there was given unto him... The him here is talking about the the beast that's come out of the sea, which we've identified as the the Gentiles coming out of the sea, in this case, specifically the Roman uh, Empire. Look at our previous videos on that. I'm not going over that in this video, but it's already been laid out. So there was given unto him, that's the Roman Empire, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. So very simply stated there, the Roman Empire was given the ability to uh, to take out Jerusalem and to have the Roman Jewish War and to completely obliterate the Jewish Temple. This would be ending the Old Covenant completely. And for more information on that, you can just simply read Josephus or any historian on the Roman Jewish War. the The heat of that battle, where the Romans uh, the siege on Jerusalem was la- lasted from forty for forty two months, from sixty six to eighty seventy. So just a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, This is a reminder of the visions that we've already looked at in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 8. Jimmy, I just want to tell you the last few videos, 
that you've been reading, I think has added so much and I'm, it, it helps me so much and I appreciate it. So if you don't mind reading again today, um, if you could read Daniel chapter seven and verse, verses eight, 20 and 25, please. All right. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And then verse 25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, and times, and the dividing of time. So we see a couple of uh, characteristics here that we carry over into our study. First of all, um, we're seeing that this is the fourth beast in Daniel. And remember, the successive kingdoms is what we're talking about in Daniel. So we have the the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and then finally the one that Jesus was born in, the Roman Empire. Here we talk about this beast that we read about Revelation, the Roman Empire, is given this mouth that's speaking these great things, this great, these great words of blasphemy, these, these lofty ideas. And notice in verse number 25 that you read, uh, it is given into his hand. Uh, what is given into his hand? Until a time, that's singular, times, that's plural. So most commentators, and I don't think there's really any I don't think there's any position that disagrees with this, but we have a time and times that would be one plus two is three, and a dividing of time would be three and a half. So I actually, when I was a dispensationalist, they also took that as three and a half years. I don't think that's a point of contention. I think most um, scholarly work will, will say that's three and a half years. So I don't think that's a point of contention, but it matches up perfectly with what we're reading here in, in Revelation 13. So in other words, when we're talking about them, get the Roman Empire being given a mouth, in other words, they have the the ability to communicate, and what they are communicating is blasphemous words, and they're going to specifically have those words for forty two months. Speaking of the Roman Jewish siege uh, in uh, AD sixty six to AD seventy, so let's go ahead and head back. Um, maybe, maybe actually one more, one more um, supporting verse, and that's Revelation eleven. Yeah, Revelation 11 and verse number 2, which we've already read and we've gone into detail in a couple of uh, videos ago. But let's go ahead and read Revelation 11 too. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. So we keep seeing this forty-two months um, time period come up, this forty-two months. And notice here, and we've already talked about this in our Revelation 11 study, obviously, but the temple is being measured. If I, if you came home and you walked in your house and I'm measuring your kitchen, first of all, what on earth are you doing here, right? <laughs> and I'm just measuring. I'm like, what's the big deal? I'm measuring your kitchen. What What interest would I have in measuring your kitchen? I mean, your first question would be, who let Ken in or why did you break in? <laughs> but your second question would be, if somebody's going to break into our house, they might steal something, they might, but he's got his tape measure out. You, if I said, no, it doesn't matter, nothing. I, I just, I was curious how big it was. That's all, you know, or let's make it, let's make it less uh, criminal. Let's say you come over to my house and let's say you walk in and I'm, and I'm measuring my living room. Okay. And you say, you say, what, what, you know, what are you doing? And I say, what? You don't measure your rooms? And that would all be very, very odd. What would you walk away if you, if you got back into your car and you're driving away from my house and you saw that I measure, was measuring my living room? Very, very plain, basic idea. You'd be thinking, he's got a plan for the living room. Yeah, he's going to get a... Uh... A new flooring, he's going to get a new carpet, yep. whatever, yeah. 
doing something. So if I were to say to you, um, there's a destruction coming to my house. Let's just say I had knowledge that my house is going to be totally destroyed. And my living room was the access point to God. We have to use our imagination here. You walk in and I'm measuring that part of the house. And I tell you, my house is going to be destroyed. But we were previously using my yard as a way to prepare ourselves to be able to get into the living room. I had to go through a number of steps. I had to wash my hands a certain way and so forth. And you were to say, okay, he's measuring the living room. Now that I know there's a purpose for it, we're going we're, we're gonna to recreate the living room because the whole house is getting destroyed and this is our access point to God. And you say, well, but what about the yard? And I say to you, oh, the people that are going to come destroy the house, I'm going to give it to them. And they're just going to walk all over it. Okay, this is, we have to put all these thoughts together. What we're reading about here is that the Romans are going to come in and they're going to destroy the temple, the access point to God. The courtyard, which was us getting prepared, is now not needed anymore. That means that God has another plan. We're no longer going through the Aaronic priesthood and the high priest is no longer going to get prepared in the same way that he did with the laver and the, and the brazen altar. Um, where he's no longer going to make that initial atonement for himself. This is all going to be different now. But we are measuring the temple. So there will be a temple, but there won't be any preparation into entering into the temple. So what he's saying is, don't measure the courtyard. We have no need for the courtyard. The courtyard itself, we're not going to reuse it. But we are going to reuse the temple measurements. In other words, there will be a temple system but it'll be a totally different approach. That's what's being said here. Um, another thing we should point out, Jimmy, as we're getting going here in, in verse number five, is you'll notice here um, that we're talking about this 42 months, which links us back to the tabernacle temple idea. Look at verse number six. And he, that's the beast of the sea, the Roman empire, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So what they were blaspheming, um, the idea of blaspheming is to make empty something that should be very holy, to make profane or regular something that should be very holy or set apart. And notice where they were doing this. They were doing this in the tabernacle. We learned in Revelation 11, too, that you just read, there's the temple they were measuring. So there's something very interesting here. Um, kind of the illustration that I've used before, I may have said it on your uh, on your channel before, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself because I can't remember, but I think a very good illustration, at least we can hear it again. I repeat myself and I, every day, <laughs> several <that's> times. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's good. It's good to hear it in in, um, <laughs> in a rote in repetition. But if we were, if you and I were to travel and uh, and go north north from uh, Tennessee, we go north and uh, we we finally get to New York. And you and I are going to do a documentary on New York. Okay. Now, if we do a documentary on New York and we go to um, Yankee Stadium, you know, we, we, we interview man on the street. We, we interview hot dog vendors, you know, um, you know, we talk about, um, uh, Times Square. Uh, we go into the park that's in the middle of the city there. Um, and, and you and I also take a trip over to where the twin towers are because the year is 2000. We did this in 2000. And we look up and we see the twin towers. We look at, we talk about the office spaces that are in there and the, and the, the way they were built with the steel they were built with. And our documentary is very, very precise. And we, we talk about what Rudy Giuliani did with, you know, taking on the mob and he, you know, really cleaned up the city. And we're, we're, it's, it's the year is 2000 and we're talking about everything. And we're talking about Patrick Ewing for those of you who know sports and I'm trying to think of some names back then. We're talking about uh, Lawrence Taylor. Look at me getting New York sports on from 2000 earlier. Um, and we do a documentary on that. Okay. Now, if you didn't know what year we did that, but you're watching this documentary, and we show the Twin Towers, 
it, you could you could put down a, a chunk of money, safe bet. It was before two thousand one. Why? Because a significant event happened mm-hmm. September eleventh, two thousand one, that made those two towers not there anymore. It would be crazy for me to make a documentary in two thousand twenty four and talk about the twin towers as if they were still standing and never mention their destruction. It actually, I would think in some ways it would actually be um, kind of uh, deceitful to make people who have never been to New York think that they're still standing. Mm -hmm. When was Revelation written anyway? Well, we've already done the Revelation dating game, but here we have uh, uh, these references to the tabernacle, the temple of God still standing and being measured. Why are they being measured? Because they're going to be replicated later, but not the courtyard. Leave those out. The Gentiles are going to step on those for 42 months. They're going to trample them. And so here we see that they are speaking blasphemies against God, blasphemies against, do you think the Romans cared about the temple or the tabernacle? No. Hmm. The only reason they hated the temple and Nero desperately wanted to see the temple come down. And eventually we see this uh, with, with as, as Titus comes in and being commissioned for this before he was even Caesar. But the hatred was a hatred for the Jews. They only hated it because the Jews loved it. Mm-hmm. And so they're speaking blasphemies against God, against his tabernacle, and against them that dwell in heaven. In other words, those that have uh, the, that are in covenant with Christ couldn't stand people that were in covenant with Christ. These Christians, these Christ followers, I mean, they don't, they don't easily bow the knee. They don't take part of Nero worship. They don't take part of Caesar worship. Remember, we're writing to seven churches that are in heavy, heavy, heavy Neuronic worship. These are in hotbeds of Nero worship at the time of this writing. And so they are, the, these seven churches are all having to make a decision. Do we go and bow the knee before Caesar? Remember what they shouted at the, at the, at the foot of, at the foot of Pilate, really. And he said, um, you know, what should we do with Jesus? Is he a king? And they said, we have no king but Caesar. Well, what should I do with him? Crucify him. Mm. May his blood be on us and on our children. Well, what should we do with Barabbas? Set him free. Give us Barabbas. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. Mm. Let's go ahead and head into um, verse number seven. You know, oh, sorry, I, you got I, something? I guess I was always taught that when they were measuring that, when he was told to measure that temple, he was measuring the, the next one that hasn't been built yet. <laughs> he was already... Yeah. He was measuring that one. You know? Yeah, yeah, me too, me yeah. too. Yeah, you know, and, and I'll go back again, and we could just kind of say this many, many times. Whatever thoughts we have of the text need to come out of the text. If anybody hears me teaching anything that is not from the Bible, or, or my thoughts aren't derived from the text, it needs to all come out of here. And if somebody wants to talk about a third temple idea, then I need to see a third temple here. Now, Jimmy, we're going to actually look at a supporting verse here in a little while in our study. It's going to go to Second Thessalonians chapter two. There is no. I'll say this clearly, and I'll have. I'll challenge anybody on this. We can have have a good time going back and forth with this. The Bible not one time ever teaches of any kind of a physical third temple. Not once. Not ever. It's assumed you already have to think that and then read that into the text. It never says that. Yeah. Um, the only third temple talked about in the Bible is Jesus's body. And then when we become identified with him, then our bodies are identified with Christ and his identity becomes ours. Then our bodies all are making up this, this, this uh, new temple that is Jesus's body. That's why he says, hey, your name is Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter. I'm going to call you Petros, stone. And Peter goes on and says, you're living stones built up. In Ephesians, it talks about a, we're building up into a house that's fitly framed together, it says in Ephesians. And we're that, we're that living temple because we are the body of Christ. That's the real third temple theology. So hmm. let's go to verse number seven. And it was given unto him, that is to the Roman Empire, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. 
and power was given uh, given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. There was nobody above the Roman Empire. They had total uh, authority, if we could say they were a sovereign uh, kingdom, and they had power over every every nation, language, and tongues, and it was given them complete power. As you know, we know as being followers of Christ that God used them as an instrument of death. He used them as a punishing rod. But this beast had power over all of mankind. Um, this is very, very similar to the empire that we see described in Daniel chapter 7 in verse number 21, where we're describing the little horn. So let's go ahead and read that real quickly. I, I know one day, uh, Jimmy, we're probably going to do a, probably a study in Daniel. We sure need to, but at least people can get a flavor. Daniel's fairly simple when you understand it's consecutive Mm-hmm. Uh, um, kingdoms, Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian, Rome. And it's going chronologically, and the key phrase in there is, in the days of these kings, yeah. somebody's going to come. And so all we're doing is following over, seeing the exact same imagery in Revelation, and taking it at face value. So uh, Daniel seven twenty one, brother. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. So they, they're making war with the saints is the key there. So the, the Romans are eventually going to take up the mantle of seeing the Christians as the ones that will not bow the knee to Caesar. Um, and this is very similar to what we're seeing also here in verse number 17. We'll read that in, the, in a moment. But they're going to have to, these saints are going to have to make a decision. Are they for the lamb or are they for the beast? Are you for Jesus or Caesar? And so we're going to see about this mark here that they're, they're going to be forced to, to make a decision. We're going to look at that a little bit later in our, in our study here. Let's go ahead and look at verse number eight. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of, the, uh, in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So when we talk about Jesus being slain from the foundation of the world, that's not literal. What that means is that it was part of God's plan all along in his omniscience that he knew he was going to redeem mankind. So this is not a plan B, as I was often taught. You know, Israel was plan A, Israel failed. So we have a parenthesis called the church. That's plan B. We're going to go back to a failed plan A after the church is raptured out. That's not biblical. This was the plan from the beginning. And Jesus coming and dying for the world and being the, the atoning sacrifice, the substitutionary atonement, it was plan A from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And notice here in verse number eight, this is another way of saying, basically, as w- in one way or another, all the unsaved will worship the Roman Empire as God. So we see the same language that if you're not saved, if you're not in covenant, if you're not in the Lamb's Book of Life, you are going to start viewing the Roman Empire as God and start mm-hmm. worshiping the Roman Empire as God. And so the angel reminds John in verse number nine, if any man have an ear, let him hear. I think I've probably mentioned to you before. I've always thought that was sort of a, a silly phrase when I was a kid, like, well, what else are you going to do with your ear? You know, or I, I didn't understand what it meant. The older yeah. that I've gotten though, Jimmy, man, I sure understand what this means. What it's talking about is humility. If you have an ear to hear, then you can understand what John is saying here through the, through the angel. And so this is a phrase often said by Jesus. It's a, it's another way of drawing careful attention to the readers. It's kind of a way of highlighting something and saying to the reader. It's kind of like, if you can imagine this, it's kind of a way for John to wink at the reader saying, you need to put some of these things together. Because remember, this is being dispersed to the seven churches, a hotbed of, of Nero worship at the time. This is a master plan of what's going to happen. This is a a special prophetic revelation from God to a heads up for those that are saved in those seven cities. And so in a way, a Roman soldier could pick up the book of Revelation and not have one clue what it's about. Um, Let's talk about these two beasts for a second and what what I mean. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Jimmy, if if you were to see if you were to see a drawing and the drawing was an elephant with a suit on okay cartoon and the elephant had 
a big machine gun in his hand and he was strapped with bullets on either side coming down. You know, he had a bazooka on his back and it was an elephant. Oh, oh, and in his pocket right here in his, in his, in his suit coat, you see an American flag sticking out. Okay. And then, uh, you see, uh, another part of the, the, the cartoon as it pans back, you see a donkey is behind him and the donkey's looking around and he's got a big barrel in front of him. And the barrel has the words confiscated on it, confiscated on it. And you see in the broken pieces of guns in the barrel, broken pieces that he's confiscated. And he's looking over at the elephant. Okay. What on earth does that mean? What, what a crazy image. But you know what, Jimmy? That image is so easy for you to understand. Yeah. I mean, in what other culture? You, you want to try to go, try to go to China 400 years ago and tell them what I just said and say, do you understand? They go, huh? And then, then you say, yeah, then the elephant turns around and says, give me liberty or give me death, right? I mean, it's like you and I understand. I don't even have to explain to everybody what political satire I'm talking about. It's so right. obvious. Right. It, but, but here, so this is exactly what's going on in Revelation. These two beasts represent political satire. It's the same thing. And so all I'm saying to people that are listening about the donkey and the elephant is, I mean, if anybody watching this video has any idea about, you know, the political uh, state of, of, our, of our country in, in, in these days. And by the way, I think the people the last, what, what would it be? 50, 70 years would understand that. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't remember where the symbols when donkey and elephant came in, but um, long time, well, long I've, time people in our country would have. I've always known it to be, and I'm over 50. <laughs> So, yes, there we, it's been at least go. 50 years. There we go. There we go. So if any man has an ear, let him hear. It's a way of kind of saying, guys, you can get this. Let, let's look at a couple of these these markers of if you have ears to hear, let him hear. If you if you would, Jimmy, let's go to Revelation 2 again, and let's read verses 7, 11, and 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So this is specific kind of wording that we're talking about to those who are in Christ, who are part of the body of Christ, who are having a new name written down. We're talking about manna. This is all the stuff that was in the Ark of the, the, Ark of the Covenant. Mm. We're talking about manna. We're talking about Aaron's budding rod represents Christ. And now a new name is been, being written on tablets, and it's our name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so we're just drawing all these parallels together, all of the imagery from the sea beast together, and just saying the sea beast is going to have a lot of power, but only for 42 months. And for those of you who have an ear to hear, meaning go back now and read all the times it said that, you'll be given the ability to overcome this with the word of your testimony by the blood of the Lamb. And, but now we're going to kind and, of transition. And in case somebody missed it, the sea beast we, we learned last this, week was Rome. We learned this, the sea beast is the Roman Empire. Yeah. Um, and go back to that video. We actually looked at um, verses on that to be able to see that the water represents the Gentiles mm -hmm. out of the water. We're not, we're not just making this up. We read this literally from the text right. itself. Right. Um, and so go back to that video and you can see that. And the land here, when we read about earth or land, um, it's, 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 it's said in a way where it basically means the land of Israel. The land is always representative of, of Israel. And so we, we established that in one of our videos in the past. Um, it would be the same as if, you know, if I was standing in a, you know, an old Western movie and, uh, you know, I'm the sheriff of the town and I say, I have authority throughout all this land. Well, you would say, oh, do you mean the entire world? 
No, if I say all this land, I mean where my jurisdiction is. And right. so when we're talking about the land and we're in reference to Jerusalem, it's talking about Israel. So we'll, that'll be more clear as we go. All right, let's go to verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of the faith of the saints. Now, these, the language here, Jimmy, we've talked about this before in case those, somebody hasn't heard this yet. If you've been following us, I'm sure you have. Revelation is the most biblical book in the Bible. And what I mean by that is, obviously, it's all equally Bible. But what I mean by that is Revelation quotes the Bible in more than any other book. So we, ha- on average, have a quote or an allusion to the rest of the 65 books, primarily the Old Testament, on average, two times for every one verse in Revelation. So for every verse we're reading, there's at least a quote or an allusion two times per verse. That's an average. So you might have more you know, in some than others. But I, this is primarily... I, I remember saying that either to you or to Missy that this... This study, we're, yeah, we're going through the book of Revelation, but we're actually going through the whole Bible in this study of the book of Revelation. It's pretty cool. It is absolutely amazing, and 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 uh, you and I have said this before too. Hopefully, we're just showing folks how to how to go slow and read and to how to read their Bible, mm-hmm. because you know I I just had a discussion with somebody yesterday on Revelation nineteen, and they were giving me their thoughts of how, why they thought it was future. The thing is, Jimmy. When the Bible makes a quotation of the Old Testament, we must go back and study that. You know, when the author is trying to make a point, he's trying to make a point and he's quoting something, that quotation gives us insight. We must pause and go read that. So the language here in verse number 10 is are mainly taken from Jeremiah 15.2 and Matthew 26.52. So if you don't mind reading Jeremiah 15.2, brother. And it shall come to pass, if they say unto thee, Whither shall we go forth? Then thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord, Such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. Then Matthew twenty six fifty two. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So Jesus is, how many of you knew that? Jesus is basically reiterating Jeremiah 15, 2, and he's talking to Peter. And so the, the point here is, if Jesus was trying to build a military empire, he would use a sword. But the language of, the, of a military empire is the language of death. You'll do what we say, or we're going to destroy you. But that's not the message of the cross, and that's not the that's not the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Kingdom of God will be won over by love and by faith. And the message of the cross is the gospel of Jesus that He's King, and that we invite people to become of His sovereign kingdom. And so here we see that we are using this language again, getting across the point that we're not going into a war with swords to try and win land. There is no land to win in Christianity, which is actually a new concept Mm -hmm. from the, from the new covenant as it was from the old covenant. The old covenant was built on military prowess. The book of Joshua and these military campaigns of going in and taking the land of promise involved a tremendous amount of bloodshed. There was a national interest in land. But now, our interest is in fulfilling the law of Christ. There is no land to be had, primarily, Jimmy, because the meek, those in covenant, inherit the earth, all of it. Mm-hmm. This is all the Lord's. Every, every, everything here is King Jesus's. Yeah, He's taken over everything. We're not looking for Jerusalem, physical Jerusalem. Give it to the Gentiles. Who cares? Or out, out, of, out of covenant Jews, the apostate Jews can have it. Right now, the, the Muslims and Jews are, the Orthodox Jews, however you want to say it, out of covenant Jews are fighting with the Muslims over. Have at it, guys. It means nothing to us. As far as spiritually, it doesn't. I, I wish peace for them. I don't think there will be. I, I, I don't want any innocent bloodshed. So in that sense, I care. 
Hmm. But as far as spiritually speaking, we have no special interest in land anymore. Hmm. So Jesus is saying, put away your sword. So here, I'm going to read a, a quick quote from Milton Terry. Milton Terry said this about this passage. He says, two forms of persecution are specified as those wherein the patience and the faith of the saints are to be chiefly exhibited. And at the same time, the admonition is given not to resort to the use of carnal weapons, the sword, for the propagation of God's truth. Here in the counsel of Jesus in Matthew 26, 52 is affirmed. At the same time, the words given uh, give assurance that retribution will come in due time to the persecuting power. In other words, Jesus is going to conquer everything, like we were saying, through the gospel, through the faith and love. And he will not be conquering anything by sword. So here, kind of bringing this thing full circle, let's go ahead and head back to Revelation 13. Here we see in verse number 10, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. So here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In other words, if the Roman Empire is coming in with a sword, here's something you can take away from that if you're in covenant with the, with the, with the Father. And that is, they'll die by the sword. Their system, their world system, the way that they're living their life is by the sword, and there's no good ending. Don't fear them that have the sword, because their end will be with the sword. But if, you're, if your weapon of choice is faith, the end of your life will be faith. And it says, herein is the patience and faith of the saints. The saints live, you and I live a different way than those that find comfort in swords. So in other words, if you see the Roman army coming and they've got this powerful machine, this powerful military, listen, I know that's terrifying. I know that's scary to hear the horses, but take heart in knowing that that's not our game. Our game is a different realm our game is bigger than that. You, let me say it this way. I've said this for years. You can't out-legislate the Holy Spirit. Take comfort in that. You can't out-legislate the Holy Spirit. Let's read verse 11. Now, in verse 11, we're getting to the second part of this chapter. We're going to see now the land beast. So this is going to be a description of Israel, apostate Israel. He says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. That, er, that word earth can also be translated land, and that's why we're saying it's the land of Israel. It's descriptive. We'll see in a second here. He, uh, verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. In other words, apostate Israel has all of the physical characteristics you would assume of somebody in, in covenant with God. Their blood goes back to Abraham. Physically speaking, Look just like a lamb, but one difference. Remember what Jesus said? It's not what goes in your mouth that defiles a man. It's what comes out of your mouth. It comes from the heart. And here, this beast had all the physical characteristics of a lamb, but it didn't speak like a lamb. Its heart was very wicked. And this beast here speaks like a dragon. Now, remember, in chapter 12, we were introduced to the dragon. That was none other than the, the old serpent. That was Satan, the devil. Mm -hmm. And so the devil is the one that's behind the scenes pulling the strings here for these two beasts. You have the Roman Empire, and now we're looking at none other than the land of Israel has its own beast, apostate Israel. So here it goes on to say that it looks like a lamb. Physically, Physical characteristics looks just like Jesus from the line of Abraham even but it didn't speak like Jesus, didn't speak like a lamb, speaking like Satan. Uh, oh, let's look at a few verses here. I'm, I'm getting excited about the text here. Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and look at something we've already studied before, and that's Matthew 24 in verses 5 and verse 11. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. In Deuteronomy 13, in verses 1 through 5. If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, 
which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Let me summarize everything you just said very concisely. You'll know them by their fruits. That's what Jesus is saying. When he's saying that, he's saying, if somebody says they're a prophet, but the thing that they're saying is not what God is saying, according to the Old Testament, they should be put to death. It's now, a good thing for most. It's a good thing for a lot of modern day prophets, isn't it? That we're not in the old covenant anymore. Yeah, you, you ain't kidding, man. You ain't kidding. <laughs> there would be some people that you know. There are people that just apologize. You know, they get all this money. They write books. They have this all these you know YouTube channels, and they make all these uh, prophets, prophetic predictions, and all this. Stuff. And they're wrong. And they just said, "Oh, you know, uh, I was wrong about the you know like when they a lot of them prophesied you know that Trump would win the last election, and uh, and he didn't." And they came on and said, well, he did win. Uh, it's just they stole it from him. You know, they, they, after the fact, there's always something to be able to explain how, why they were wrong. Yeah. Um, the Bible here says that you can know them by their fruit. That's basically what's going on here. This particular beast that we're looking at in verse 11 is apostate Israel. It's the fake prophets. So maybe some of you are starting to put some light bulbs together here. We have false prophets in Revelation. Who are the false prophets? Well, first of all, they're prophets. They're viewed as prophets, but they're not real ones. So we're going to see the false prophets are apostate Jews. They're the ones that look like the lamb and physically characteristics. They look just like, they look just like Jesus. They're from Abraham, but they talk like the dragon. That's the problem. Their heart is wicked. They're far from God. They're not in covenant. Hmm. And so here, it's a reminder in Deuteronomy 13 to measure, uh, Jimmy, what do we do here? I mean, what do we do here? We are, we are, you know, we're Jewish men who love God. And there's people here who are saying things that we've heard our whole lives. There are people in Israel in, 66, in AD 66 that are saying, we just need to trust the Lord God. And we're going, sounds good. I mean, who, who would disagree with that? Mm -hmm. Except for one thing. They failed to recognize Christ as Messiah. So they're saying things that sound good, but they're, but they're saying, but I'll tell you one thing, all these followers of Christ that are trying to take our way of life from us, they need to go down. Yeah, This is wartime. So they're, they're, they're actually aligned with Satan, although they look like the lamb. That's what we're dealing with here. They didn't want to lose now, their. They didn't want to lose their position. They can't lose their position, and they don't want to lose their covenant. The Mosaic covenant is very important to them. It's their way of life. It's not just a. It's not just a special, you know, holy day like we would think of Thanksgiving or something. It's, it's they're not fighting for that kind of. Thing. They're fighting for their whole way of life. One commentator said it this way: It is important to remember that Judaism is not Old Testament religion at all. Rather. It is a rejection of the biblical faith altogether in favor of the pharisaical Talmudic history, uh, heresy, excuse me. In other words, when we are seeing Benjamin Netanyahu today in 2024, Benjamin Netanyahu is not a lover of the Old Testament. He is not following the Old Testament, obviously, because there's, no te there's no temple. They can't. Right. So they had to have a version of it that allowed them to feel good about themselves and not follow it. That would be the rabbinic writings and the Talmud. So it's not like we have dedicated Jews today 
living in Tel Aviv who are reading Genesis through Malachi. For them, it would be, you know, Genesis through Second Chronicles is their last book. They're not sitting there reading it, trying to figure out how they can be in covenant with God and how they can be faithful. They have forsaken the Old Testament altogether, and they're reading the Talmud. And they're reading the biblical, the, the rabbinic writings rather than the biblical writings. Well, so you have to understand. Well, and unfortunately, they were doing that in Jesus's day already. That's right. Because that's, that's who right. the Pharisees were. They, uh, uh, like, if you, when you are reading the old covenant scriptures, there's no Pharisees in there. This is something that happened right over that 400 period of time, 400 year period of time. Right. And, uh, it all kind, right. kind of came from the Bab. They brought it from Babylon. The, the, so they, they loved having that, those positions. And so they were already, so Jesus already knew who he was speaking to. And, uh, yes. a lot of people, I see a lot of this going on, on, uh, conversations on X and stuff about, well, Jesus was born a Jew, died, a, lived a Jew, died a Jew, and all these things. And everybody still just kind of equates that that means what we think it does today. And right. it's, it's, it was just it's two different things. Very different. Yeah. I mean, they even altered the scriptures. Um, the Grecian Empire ushered in a host of new ideas of uh, Greek mythology. The Romans then took those and they actually see Greek mythology is all about love and and feelings and philosophy, wisdom, intellect. The Romans, just to totally simplify it, the Romans took their mythology and they made it military might. They just basically took the exact same gods that the Greeks had in their mythology and they Romanized them and just basically made them strong. <laughs> Forget the, the, the wisdom part. We just want to be stronger than everybody. And well, the Jews did the same thing. The Jews took the Greek mythology and they 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 made it Jewish. That's why Paul is fighting against Jewish mythology. And he's fighting against these new books that were written between Malachi and Matthew in the intertestamental period. And he calls them Jewish fables in the book of Titus and, and many other places where they're warned to not be involved with these books that were written in the intertestamental period that got involved with mixing Greek mythology with the Jewish scriptures. Mm. So let's go ahead and go to verse number, um, you know, let me hit a couple more things here. This is so important. The rest of the, the rest of this chapter will flow pretty quickly, but we need to hit a couple of ideas before we go much further. And that is that I want people to be able to see the ungodly Jews that we're talking about. These out of, out of covenant apostate Jews, they only had power when they appealed to Rome. So in other words, you see this all throughout Acts when, when the Jews were trying to get power over the apostles, they made sure they said things in front of Rome because they wanted the Romans to persecute the Jews because they knew that their own law didn't make provisions for this. Let's look at a couple of examples of this. Acts chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So these people heard Stephen preaching. Hmm. They knew they had to take him out. 
if his message gets out, they don't have any power. But Jimmy, look at look at what good guys they are. These 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 precious people had such regard for the law of God that they followed the law of God and they knew they had to have two witnesses in the mouth of two witnesses. Well, what are you going to do when you're making up something, but you need two witnesses? Ah, I know. We'll just have people be false witnesses. So they're ironically, isn't this crazy? They're, they're so far out of covenant with God, but they're still following the law. E- even if they have to fake it, it's like, you're about to murder somebody but you still want to make sure that all your checks and your balances are followed as you need to take Stephen out. Let's go one more place. Acts chapter 14, verses 2 through 5. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them. Jimmy, if we could make a title for this, what we're going over today, this would be such an awesome title. In verse number two. The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles. That one phrase basically encapsulates this beast section mm. in um, beginning at Revelation 13, 11. It is the idea that the unbelieving Jews, which is what it says here, stirred up the Gentiles against the Christians. If, if folks would just get that one idea, you have out of covenant people connected to Abraham through blood, but out of covenant. And they are, they are stirring up, they're causing a trouble, they're stirring up the Romans against the Christians. If you can just get that, that, that a concept in your head, this whole thing makes sense. Let's go to Acts chapter 17 and verses 5 through 8. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. <laughs> so we such awesome stuff here, right? So first of all, we know the message of the early church. The message of the early church in the book of Acts was that there is another king and his name is Jesus. That was the message in Acts. There's a new king, his name's Jesus. Another thing that we learned from this passage is that the unbelieving Jews, the the term the Bible's using, we're calling that group apostate Jews, but it's the same thing. Unbelieving Jews out of covenant, they specifically were professional tattletalers. You know, these guys are are, are tattletaling on on the Christians. They're going and they're making sure that, that the Romans... In front of the Romans, they make sure that they know that these people over here, remember, like we said at the beginning of the video, I told you that come in handy. They're not saying, these guys are working on the Sabbath, or these guys are, they have no regard for the new moon. They're not saying any of that. What are they saying? Ooh, these guys said there's another king besides Caesar. Well, they knew that was, so, a, they knew that was punishable by death for sure. That's right. That's right. So now maybe people can get in their head what we're saying. This is the harlot riding on the beast. It's the harlot that was we've been reading about in all the whole Bible. The adulterous ways of out of covenant Israel, the harlot of Jeremiah, the harlot of Ezekiel. This harlot is riding on a beast. Who's the beast? Rome. And it works for a little while. Until we're going to learn later in Revelation, the beast bucks her off and devours her. 
So this imagery, I hope, I hope this is all coming together as people are reading about this. Let's go ahead and head back over to Revelation chapter 13 and make our way through. Let's look at, at verse number 12. It says, and he, remember, this is the, um, this is the land beast, the, the apostate, the unbelieving Jews. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Um, something that may be a little confusing just dramatically here. Let me make sure that is clear. You can look at the Greek if you want to on this, but I'll just kind of tell you what this is talking about in verse number 12. It could properly be read, and he, that's the unbelieving Jews, the beast, exercises all the power of the first beast, that's Rome. And when it says, it exercises the power of the first beast before him. That means in his presence. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean like the day before. It, it means in their presence. Before him means like in their presence. And that's what we're reading in the book of Acts. They are uh, exercising the power of Rome, but it only matters if Rome sees it. Rome has to see it. And so they are, like we said, they're tattletelling on the Christians that are not following the Roman laws. That's what's happening here. And then it says, whose deadly wound was healed. That's a reference back to something we've already studied. Let's go ahead and read uh, verses. Well, let's go ahead and go to Acts chapter 12 and read verses 1 through 3. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So this is all political. This is all political reasons. You notice it says in that, in that passage that um, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, these Jews were trying to cause the Roman officials to act in a certain way. And that's really what we're getting across here. Um. Let's go ahead and read verse, verses uh, 13 and 14 together in Revelation. And he, that's the land beast, doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven at the earth, on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So this is the idea of apostate Israel is trying to do these mighty acts in front of Rome and encouraging everybody they possibly can to fall in line and worship the worship this idea of the Roman Empire can take over this region and to fall in line with this. This is exactly what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, 24. So let's go ahead and read that as a reminder, even though we've already done a lot of work in Matthew 24. Mm. But Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So this is what's happening. They're trying to do the, the they're trying to do the very best they can, folks, to look like a lamb. They're doing all they can. They already look like a lamb. They've got a lot going for them. The biggest tell, though, for them is that they, they speak like a dragon. They're saying the things of Satan. They're doing the bidding of Satan, even though the physical characteristics of apostate Jews look just like Jesus. But we can tell them apart because of what they're doing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verses 9 and 10. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So here we have in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, which is, by the way, one of the most misunderstood passages that I've heard uh, for futurists that they constantly talk about, because in here it talks about a temple. Well, Folks, got to tell you, there's a temple standing at the time of Paul's writing. He could point over and say that temple right there. And this is a primary place where people teach about a third temple, third yeah. temple theology. The problem with that, that teaching is there's a temple standing when Paul wrote it. 
just like there is when Revelation was written. There's a temple standing. So when we're talking about the temple, who would ever be a, a primary uh, audience, a contemporary audience, would hear about a temple that's standing and say, the temple, and they go, oh yeah, they can, they can look up and go, oh, that temple right there. How would they ever say, you know what I bet this is talking about? This is probably talking about not that temple, because that's probably going to get destroyed. And then if this is talking about a temple, it's probably a remade temple in the future in thousands of years. You would never, never, never come to that conclusion from just reading this. The only way that people have that thought when they read Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is somebody told them to think that. The original audience would never, never, never do that when there's a temple standing at the time of the writing. Mm -hmm. So this is another clear and obvious thing. In verses 9 and 10, Second Thessalonians 2, is the same exact thing we're talking about. These are saying, even him whose coming is after the world working of Satan. That's the land beast. Their working is after the working of Satan with lying lips, with powers and signs and all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They look like the lamb. They, they, do, they do miracles in the same way a lamb would do miracles. But the problem is they speak like a dragon. That's the problem. Mm. The problem is they love Satan. They're not in covenant. And so this is exactly what, what Paul is, is. Paul is saying exactly what we're reading about in Revelation 13. This is a commentary on Revelation 13. Jude is a commentary on Revelation. Second Peter is a commentary on Revelation. I mean, these are clearly the same exact, exact events. Somebody mm. would have to teach you that they're different. But um, first century readers would have a problem with this. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13 again and continue in verses 15 through 17. And we think we're the smartest people ever have lived so far. <laughs> it takes a lot. Well, you know, the thing is, it takes a lot of work to bridge 2,000 years of uh, culture and, and this kind of thing. So we're having to do some heavy lifting because this would have been very natural for the first century readers. They didn't have the hangups that right. we have. Right. We have to unlearn just to go back to the basics. And in that sense, we're doing a lot of heavy lifting. But yeah, if we could just simply say, and this is in our first video we ever did, you and I, how how would the first original immediate audience have understood this? Now, we don't know everything they knew, but we can, we can at least try and attempt to put ourselves in the position of the recipients of this letter and say, how would they have understood this? Mm -hmm. Certainly, third temple theology would not jump off the page to them. Right. Verses 15 through 17 says this. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell and uh, save he that had the mark of, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So obviously, Super popular verse um, verses here. A lot of ink has been spilled trying to guess what this is. A lot of hours on YouTube has been spent trying to figure out the mark of the beast. Folks, it's just not that complicated if you use the Bible. What we're talking about here in verse number 15, you can read this very plainly in verse 15. This is mimicking the words that we have in Genesis uh, chapter 2, when we're talking about God breathing life into Adam and making a creation. Rome was the little puppet, so they thought. Apostate Jews were making Rome like their creation. They are becoming God, and they are using Rome, they thought, to use to get to the, the top of the world. And that's the same imagery that we're seeing used here in verse number 15, that they are giving, they believe they had the power to give life onto the image of the beast. Adam was made in the image of God. God breathed his uh, breath into Adam's nostrils and, and, and Adam became a living being. He became a living soul, it became a soul. And so here we see that they are mimicking that creation here, but they're the ones now breathing life into Rome. And then they told everybody, you better worship this image, the image of the beast. And so this idea of image, you can actually learn more about this if you want to go. And, and I'm just going to do this on the fly real quickly, Jimmy. In, in the book of Hebrews, let me just look at Hebrews chapter 1 real quick, because this is all imitation. This is all imitation. In Hebrews chapter 1, we read this, that 
uh, it speaks of Jesus in verse number three, who being the brightness of his glory, that means that Jesus is the illumination of the glory of God the Father, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So Jesus is the express image, express image of the glory of God. And we see that Adam is made in the image of God. He's an image bearer of God, but Jesus is made in the express image of God. Jesus is the real deal. Adam is a picture of it. And so here we see in Revelation chapter 13 that the Jews, knowing this type of creation and power, they're trying to breathe life into the beast that's coming up from the sea, which is the Roman Empire. And here it says that they are causing all to basically worship the beast or they'll be killed. That means to identify with. Now brings us to verse 16. And this very, very simple, folks, if you've not heard this teaching before, you'll walk away very encouraged. We're going to use just Bible here and make a very simple observation. And he, that's the land beast, causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark. Now the word mark in the Bible just simply means that you're identified with and that somebody owns you. Um, let's look at a couple of examples of this. Um, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 15, Jimmy, if you have that up, Genesis four fifteen. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So there's a mark on Cain. So we get the idea, we get the biblical idea or definition of mark. This is God placing a mark on him that he would be protected, that somebody can't take vengeance on him, that God himself would take vengeance on Cain. Cain was worried that somebody would kill him. And so God put a mark on him and said, this one is for me to deal with. That's the general idea of Mark. We get another idea of Mark in Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. Uh, Jimmy, if we could turn there, Ezekiel 9, 4 through 6. This is the imagery of God going to destroy Jerusalem in Ezekiel chapter 9. And before he goes and destroys Jerusalem, he's identifying people who are grieving the sinfulness of Israel and that are in covenant with him. And he puts a mark on their forehead. Let's go ahead and read that. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. So in this passage, we see the mark is a good thing. The mark here is God marking with this ink horn. You can go back and read the whole passage. And he's saying, whoever has the mark, it's kind of like reminiscent of the Passover. Whoever has the mark on them, the judgment will not be given to them. So the mark here shows ownership. It's very, very simple in the Bible. The concept of a mark shows ownership. And that leads us to where the location of the mark is at. How do you identify with the beast? Well, it says here in verse number 16 that you receive this mark in your right hand or your forehead. This is also, again, biblical imagery. We, we are not biblical imagery. We are not guessing uh, what this is. A right-handed or forehead suggestion is right from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 6 through 8. Jimmy, if you don't mind reading that. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. So what he's saying here is very simple. He's saying, God is saying to Israel, I want you to obey me at your house. I want you to think about me when you're going for a walk. When you're going down the road with your children, I want you to strike up a conversation and talk about me. 
when you're doing work in the yard, I want you to be thinking about me. I want a relationship with you. And the way that he says this to them is, this is like binding these words on your right hand or between your eyes on your forehead. Right hand in the Bible is a place of activity or action. So when you're doing an action or you're doing a deed, you're doing a work, I want you to be thinking about me. Right hand, the place of power. When you're plowing the field, think about me. Okay. But also I want you to not, I don't want you just to dedicate just your deeds to me. I want your mind to be on me as well. I want it to be between your eyes. I want it to be on your forehead. So all that we're talking about with right hand is deeds and forehead is actions. You're identifying with God through your deeds and your actions. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Your deeds and your actions, your right hand and your forehead. The mark that God wanted Israel to have was that he wanted them to be identified with him in the way that they acted, in the way that they thought. And so here, the mark, the, 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 the ownership of the beast of Rome is seen in your right hand or forehead, your deeds and your actions. Your, your life will line up with the Roman Empire with the prodding from apostate Israel. That's all that the mark of the beast is. It's that you have given into the system of the Roman Empire being authoritative in your life, and you will match that up with your thoughts and your actions. And if you do this, Jimmy, you'll be protected by the beast. You'll be able to do a lot of things. You can be in the marketplace. You can buy and sell. You're part of our society, our lovely, lovely utopia, all powered by the dragon. And this land beast, this harlot, is going to ride the sea beast and all are being uh, worship, uh, worshipful towards the dragon. So this idea of the mark of the beast is very, very simple in the Bible. It has the idea of ownership. It's saying, let Rome own you, and you need to prove that out in your thoughts and your actions towards Rome. In other words, be dedicated to Rome, and all will be well. That's all we're talking about here. This has nothing to do with a vaccine, has nothing to do with social security, has nothing to do with a barcode, has nothing to do with um, you know vaccines or, or Bill Gates or Barack Obama. This is has to do with the first century identification with Rome, that you could be a part of their system, and you'll show yourself worthy by both your thoughts and your deeds and dedication to the beast. So it's not like those movies I grew up on, uh, A Distant Thunder, <laughs> The Beast. Uh, uh, yeah, there were three. Um, there were three that I watched. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of the one with the hel- the uh, helicopter um, killer bee one. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, we, uh, we all get ready. What is it? Um, two men down and up uh-huh. a hill. I wish we'd all been ready. Yeah. I, yeah. I wish we'd, that's what it is. I knew it'd come to us. So I just, yeah, I yeah. wish we'd all been ready. We used to, yeah. we used to have everybody come to the church and we'd set up a projector and screen yep. and watch those movies. Yeah. If you, if you watch that one, which by the way, I think it might be on Amazon Prime last I checked like a couple years ago. But if you, wa- if you watch that one, is it, I don't think it's called a, All Been Ready or Wish We'd All Been Ready. That's the song it, it, that's in it. It may be. The, the first one was called A Distant Thunder. Okay. The, the movie um, was. And, then, if and you, then one of them was The Beast. And yeah. There was another one. Somebody watching will put it in the comments for us. We can't think yeah. of it. But if you if you watch that though, Jimmy, you'll find a lot of the stuff we've talked about in that movie. You'll find the things that we have said in absurdum, like the locusts. So it shows it. It shows one of the um, one of the scenes in that is that one of the Bible teachers is reading Revelation and he talks about the locusts. And somebody says, you know, well, what do you think those locusts are? And the camera, the guy kind of leans back on the beach and he looks up at the sky and the camera does a really bad fade. It's so cheesy from the 70s, but it does a really bad fade. It goes from a locust and it shows a helicopter and the helicopter then takes off because that's actually their teaching. They think all of the symbolism is going to be modern warfare. Of course, now yeah. the 1970 movies are out of date. You know, they'd have to say an F-22 or something like that. But the, um, the other one was it's called cra- a- It's crazy. The other one's Thief called in the Night. Thief in the Night. Yep. I just remembered it. Yeah, you yep. <laughs> just came in my head. But um, yeah, so anyways, this the mark of the beast is no no more difficult than finding the word mark in the Bible, finding the word beast in the Bible, and finding right hand and forehead. Just put it, just put 
the author here is bridging the gap of common knowledge that the first century reader would have had with the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. A good teacher takes you from where you are to where they want you to go. He's taking them from the knowledge they had and adding the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revealing of Christ. Mm. That's what this is about. It's, it's building on the bedrock of what they've already heard in the Old Covenant and saying what difference Christ made in this situation. That's all we're doing here. Mm. And we're also building on the imagery of Leviathan. Leviathan is the sea beast. And then we also talk about this idea of this behemoth that is a land beast. Both of those are seen in the book of Job. So we're kind of drawing on familiar, like we talked about the elephant and the donkey. This is familiar satire. This is familiar imagery that we're building on a land beast and a sea beast. And now they're taking on characteristics. No no harder than that. Not, not to sidetrack you, but sure. almost everybody in the English speaking world would call that behemoth. And I, I saw a guy teaching not that long ago on this passage and he calls he called it Behemoth or something like that. Behemoth. I don't know if that's more accurate, but everybody it, would say behemoth. Behemoth, yeah. yeah. You know, when you get you get into these these Hebrew words that are transliterated and you could uh you know, I would say the majority of our English versions of them probably are off because we're we're really just trying to say Hebrew words and like, for example, when we say Hades, everybody knows what we're talking about, but it's Hadas. You know, we talk about they worshipped Baal, it's Baal. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you have a hiccup, Baal. Yeah. Um, so, so who knows? You know, like, technically speaking, the Tower of Babel is the Tower of Babel. But I don't say that because I would think I was wrong with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Last verse, verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beasts. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. I'll just say this about this. I, I think we did talk about this when we were doing the dating of Revelation. Um, but let me just say a couple of obvious things. First, most obvious thing, the biggest thing I want to get across that is I'm the most comfortable saying, biblically speaking, whatever this means, John expected his readers to know exactly who this was. Basically, you have a numbering system. The number is not 666. The number is 666. Because the reason I'm saying that is because if you let somebody change this to 666, then all you have to do is find the number six somewhere in, in the world. And then you find a second six and you find a third one and you can have a theory. No, it's not three individual sixes. The number here is six. 166. So something adds to that one number. It's one number, not three. And so it's important because there's so much bad teaching out there and they find the number six somewhere. I just got to find two more. And now we have the mark, you know, we have the, the mark of the beast, the number. So here's the idea. This one number that's 666 reveals to the contemporary reader who we're talking about. Now, Notice it says, here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number. That's another way for our author, John, revealed by the, the, the angel. It's a way of them to wink. It's kind of like for him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Maybe if they, you have understanding. Maybe they didn't want the Romans to understand what they were saying if they got a hold of this text. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So if the Romans were reading this, this would mean nothing to them. Now, especially because we're reading it in Greek. This doesn't translate in Greek, but but here's the thing, Jimmy, we've talked about this on our dating of Revelation. I don't know 100% who this is talking about. I think it's Nero. And here's something interesting. Nero, at the time of this writing, was in charge. Nero didn't die until 69, AD, AD 69, and he killed himself. And that was the year of the four, four emperors, the mm -hmm. civil war going on in Rome. But... Revelation is written before that because it all starts in 60, AD 66. So Nero is the one that's on the throne right now. If you take Nero Caesar in Hebrew, see, every, every Hebrew letter has a corresponding number. So for, for And also a picture, but we won't get into that. But this is called gematria. And Nero Caesar does add up to 666, 666. The numerical value of Nero Caesar is 666. So... Is that, is that who it's talking about? I think so. 
Um, yeah, I do. But this is but this is what I do know without even guessing about anything because we're doing a Bible study. Here's what I do know: John, writing this in the first century, expected his readers who were Jewish to know who he was talking about. In other words, they did not decode this and say, you know, who's Barack Obama? Or like I've heard before, Ronald, six letters, Wilson, six letters, Reagan, six letters, Ronald Wilson, Reagan, six, six, six. That's that's not what we're doing here. The first century readers would never have thought that. That's not how Gematria works, and they don't know who that is. But also notice here, it says here, Jimmy, here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. It's the number of a beast. It says, for it is the number of a man. So the number of a beast is the number of a man. Now, if the beast is, we're talking about the beast being the Roman Empire, just like Nebuchadnezzar was identified as a beast, he was also the king of Babylon. So here we have kind of in and out using terminology of a beast being the head of the Roman Empire, also identified as a man being Nero. And we can get, if you go watch our video on the dating of Revelation, we go into this much, much more on there. You know, with this idea of 666, Jimmy, another, there's only one other place in the whole Bible that we see this number 666, I should be saying. Um, and that is that 1 Kings chapter 10 describes Solomon. Uh, remember Solomon who, in a lot of ways, Solomon, who whose name means peace, Shalom Solomon, um, he starts off like a lamb and he ends up like a beast. So he's like a lamb-like figure that ends up like a beast. Hopefully he um, comes to the Lord in humility of, towards the end of his life. But we see that he becomes richer and more powerful. Um, he receives, remember, these 666 talents of gold to kind of bolster his desire to become richer and more powerful. He wants to impress those who come to see him, like, remember, the Queen of Sheba. And it's it's 666 is this this exact number. It's the only other place used in the Bible. So he's puffed up with pride to receive gold. It's very interesting that that's the other place that was used in a leader that starts off like a lamb and ends up like a beast. So this is the, defi the defining characteristic that we see of this number 666. It's those that are out of covenant with God and they're actively campaigning against God. It's the number of both man it's the number of beasts. So really, it's the trinity of trinities we have here. And uh, ironically, it all adds up to, in the Hebrew, it does spell out Nero Caesar. So very, very fascinating there. Um, but yeah, that's the whole idea. You got you to identify with Nero. You got to worship him. If you identify with him in thoughts and deeds, then you, you're, you're good. You can buy and sell. And if not, then you're one of those Christians that we are going to ride the beast and try to destroy you by the power of the dragon. And we're going we're gonna to wage war on you because you're the enemy. You followers of Christ can have no place in this, you know, have no, have no bearing in this place in the first century. That's the idea of Revelation 13.